But lastly, verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let me slow down and read that one more time. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will. That's a hard statement. Um, Peter's making explicit something here that's been a little bit implicit up to this point, that our suffering, not a bit of it, is haphazard or accidental. Uh, Not a bit of it was something that uh, God missed. All of it, all of it, has, has to come through His hands first before it comes to your life. And think about it. It has to be this way. If, if God is going to use suffering in order to purposefully bring about refinement and transformation in your life, then it has to be willed by Him. It has to be intentional. You don't accidentally make a perfect work of art. You, you do it intentionally, as is God with us. And this is the part about God that sometimes we don't like. We'd really like it if um, luxury led to transformation. That, uh, you know, bliss led to transformation. Why has it got to be suffering? And yet, your kids, your parents, If you ask them to do something hard that you know needs to be done in order for them to grow into the healthy human adult that you want them to become, um, it's probably true uh, that very few of them respond with, yes, Father, I just trust you. I, you know, that sounds really unpleasant, but you've never steered me wrong. That's not usually the initial reaction that we get. Probably something more like, oh, really? So don't feel bad. Sometimes that's your reaction to how God is working in your life. He's got big enough shoulders. He understands. Uh, But hopefully in time we can pivot to God and trust God my soul, to you, a faithful creator. Uh, The the way that we ought to respond, he tells us. And I just want to kind of unpack this. Uh, It's it's, it's got a lot in it. So, entrust their souls to faithful creator while doing good. This This is Peter's offered response to how we should deal with suffering that's willed by God in our lives. First of all, he mentions our soul. Soul should refer to the whole person, but but it should get us thinking about more than just this life. Soul should get you thinking about the fact that there is eternity. Every single human being is an eternal creature. They will last forever in some place, in some way. And what Peter's starting to draw out is, guys, let's let's not get so narrowly focused on this little itty-bitty speck of time. This is not the sum total of our lives. They last forever. You're going to spend a whole lot more time outside of this life than in this life. And praise God that suffering is not a necessary part of your human existence. It is in this season, but not forever. One day it's gone. One day very soon it's gone. One day it's very, very soon it's gone forever and ever and ever. It's just a short time that we suffer. It's just a span of a few decades in comparison to the overwhelming weight of glory. He says, entrust your soul to a faithful creator. Both these are 
paramount in our understanding of who it is we entrust ourselves to. First of all, he's creator. He's the creator of the universe. I mean, have you ever just stopped and paid attention to creation recently? And how astounding it is? How intricate and detailed and unified and glorious, beautiful. He made that. He thought it up, spoke it into existence. He sustains it by the word of his power. This God is powerful beyond your imagination. Which means nothing is outside of his control. Nothing is going to, you know, overpower him or overwhelm him. But God being all-powerful is not necessarily good news. You see, if he was, if he was a maniacal creator, you're in real trouble. But that's not what Peter says he is. He's not, a, he's not an evil creator. He's a faithful creator. F- faithful means follows through. Faithful means keeps his promises. And see, what is incredible about this God is, though, though creator of the universe, right, should command the respect and awe and wonder of every single one of his creatures, promised long ago that he had a plan in order to deal with the sin that we brought into this world. And in order for him to be faithful to that promise, it was going to cost him dearly even the life of his own son. So that Jesus, the second member of the Trinity, becomes incarnate among us, lives a perfect life, died on a cross for our sins, rose from the dead so that God could be faithful to his promise to us. And, and this is what Romans 8.32 says, that he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for, his all, for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If he gave us Jesus, then he means to do good to us. He's not going to give you Jesus and then be like, well, I've changed my mind. No, he, he's already given you his best as a demonstration of I love you, I'm for you. Even though it doesn't seem like it in this moment, Trust me. He's earned that. This word for entrust uh, is giving, so, so, giving to someone for safekeeping or turning over to someone to care for. Um, and God deserves that from us because He is both great as Creator. There's nothing in your life that's going to be too much for Him. And He is good and faithful as Savior. There's nothing about which you should question him regarding his love for you. He's already proven that. And being in his hands, his will, is, it is the safest place to be. And he says that we're to do this while doing good. Uh, suffering is not an excuse for sinning or license or, well, I deserve this because my life's so hard. No, no, you demonstrate trust in the Lord when things are hard by continuing to obey Him and trust Him and do good as He's commanded you to do. 